I get to sit down with Trey Stevens, who I met for the first time in person last year at a conference for military veterans. Um, Trey is, like myself, a native Ohioan, uh, and uh, he went to the Georgetown Foreign School of Service, worked in the government briefly, or I guess maybe not so briefly. Um, and Trey, we wanted you to come on up here. Um, from what I understand, got sort of frustrated one day when Palantir came and pitched uh, your boss, and uh, so you basically said, I'm out of here, went to Palantir, spent six years there, and then was recruited by Peter Thiel, where he is at Founders Fund, and also co-founded Andrel. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, 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 no, no, my pleasure. And I just found out, um, well, I'd seen the brand in passing, and I guess, did you bring it out with you? Oh, uh, no, yeah, no, you didn't. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I just found out also that Trey has yet another company, as if he's not busy enough, that he co-founded called Soul. Um, and I just thought maybe the crowd here would be interested in knowing this. This is a reader that weighs um, not much more than a pair of sunglasses. Do you want to explain a little bit about what it is, if you don't mind? I just think it's sure, so cool. Sure, yeah. Um, so, as some of you might know, my co-founder at... Uh, Anderl is Palmer Lucky, who is the inventor of Oculus. And uh, early in the early days of coming together with the idea of Anderl, I mentioned to him that I really wanted to be able to read in VR, but the form factor doesn't really work that well because it's really heavy, short battery life. Um, the eye tracking is not a, a great thing when you're moving your head trying to stay focused on a page of reading. Um, and so um, Single purpose computing is really cool. Um, as kind of Jesse just alluded to as well, I think the rabbit is awesome. Uh, the idea behind this is that it's literally just an e-reader that you wear. And so, you know, it weighs about, as uh, Connie said, it weighs about the same as a pair of glasses. Um, and you can kind of flip through the pages uh, with, a little rem with a little remote. And that's, that's the Soul Reader. He, he let me put them on. I think they're so cool. Uh, and $350-ish. Uh, yeah. Uh, but a very a, a long 15,000 people on the wait list. But anyway, if you're interested, as I am, um, it's soulreader.com, S O L. S O L reader.com. Yeah, anyway, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, we're here to talk about Andrel and Founders Fund. I thought we could start with Founders Fund because I know that we've got investors in the audience and they're always really curious to understand how investors operate and think. I did catch Brian Singerman's. Um, uh, appearance yesterday at, at um, Upfront Summit, and he talked a little bit about what makes Founders Fund different. Um, no board seats, uh, no reserves for funding for, for, for companies. You would rather just invest that money in the company and another fund, which I think is makes sense to me. I know for a long time that was sort of frowned upon, and I'm not really sure why anymore. Um, what other ways do you think that Founders Fund is somewhat different from traditional venture funds? Yeah, I would say that our, our name is actually illustrative of this. Um, the, the reason we're called Founders Fund is that we're a fund for founders. Um, not that we're all founders ourselves, although many of us are. Um, and th the reason we think this is important is that we are founder absolutists. We don't generally take board seats. We are on some boards, but a, probably like a single digit percentage of our portfolio companies, maybe low single digit percentage. Um, and we always vote with founders. And at the point that a company no longer has a founder as CEO, we are out. We don't invest in non-founder led businesses. Um, and I, I think that really motivates us to behave in different ways where um, we are aligned and you know, founder friendly is kind of a cliche term at this point, like every VC claims that they're founder friendly. Um, but I think that in practice, being f founder friendly means sometimes taking unpopular positions, uh, even if you think that it puts the business in an awkward place. And that, that's something that we're always happy to do. And I know there's sort of like a strong debate culture there too. And it's, so how does, how does a decision to get made? Because I, I've read about this and I talked years ago with Cyan Bannister who was in and out of Founders Fund. Um, and I know there was sort of like a, a tipping point at which, you know, like some, some things you can get done on your own, some things you have to kind of like run up the chain. Where, like what are the, do you mind talking about those thresh thresholds or how that works? Yeah, I think the culture of debate is the right one. So we don't have Monday partner meetings. And the reason for that is that oftentimes when you have process, 
in the way that you get a deal done. Like maybe an associate finds the deal, a principal meets with it, they move it up to the partners, the partners bring it into the partner meeting to meet with the general partners. You, you tend to make a lot of like very mediocre investments because you have kind of a, you know, a confirmation bias. Like, well, if it made it this far, maybe it's like good enough for at least a small check or something like that. Founders Fund is very high conviction driven. And so we, you can't get an investment through the team if you're not super, super high conviction, banging the table, I would stake my career on this deal. And the value of that is that we probably have the same number as any venture fund of, of you know, dogs, of the stuff that just doesn't work at all. Um, but we have a lot more of the ones that work really, really big. Um, and I think you don't want to have a bunch of the stuff in the middle. You don't want to have the ones that maybe you get your money back, maybe you get 2x your money back, but because you haven't concentrated into your winners, it ends up dragging your IRR down. Mm -hmm. And so we're really focused on concentrating as much of the fund as we can into the best companies in any given fund. Um, and we think that that's what drives multiples. And this is what Brian was saying, we don't hold reserves. Well, we don't hold reserves because we wanna take whatever capital we have in the fund and double it back into the companies that are working the most in, in every cycle. I don't really, I, again, I don't really understand why that has not always been the case because just listening to Brian yesterday, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I think the old school thinking was that maybe a VC would mark up their own deal, but I feel like that happens now anyway um, across you know everybody's funds. Um, I did want to ask quickly. We were talking a minute ago about Keith. Keith was part of the kind of committee um, with Brian and and, and Peter. Um, and this is you know gossipy, but I talked to Keith when he left, and he said he was thinking about finding it, doing his own fund, and then he said. You know, Kosla reached out and it was, made more sense. And then subsequently, I saw in the journal that it was he was already on his way out of Founders Fund because of like some some sort of conflict. Can you address that? Because I thought it was interesting to see in the journal. It felt like somebody had said something. Yeah, I, I think that everyone kind of has their own style. Yeah. And at Founders Fund, one of the benefits that really comes down from Peter from the very beginning when we were first founded about 20 years ago is that everyone should run their own strategy. We don't have a single strategy. Um, you know, I do venture in a different way than Brian does venture. It's different than the way that Napoleon, who runs our growth fund, does venture. And that's good because we get different looks that we wouldn't otherwise get by having people executing these different strategies. Keith had a very different strategy, and he had a very specific strategy that was very hands-on, very engaged, um, and I think that Kosla is a really good fit for that, um, and obviously he was there before he came to Founders Fund, and um, I think I'm really happy that he found a place where he feels like he has a team that can back him up in, in that execution. That's really interesting, because I have seen you in the past talk about really not necessarily wanting to back founders who really need a lot of hand-holding, essentially. I mean, I think maybe you had said founders that sort of desperately need their VCs is not something like that, not the business that you want to be in. So maybe there's, maybe that's. Yeah, I think the, obviously the ideal case for a VC is you have a founder that is going to be really good at running their own business. Mm -hmm. And there's some unique edge that you can provide to help them running their business. Um, the reality is, is that that usually is not the case. Usually the investors that think they're the most value added are the most annoying and difficult to deal with. <laughs> and so the more that a founder says, I'm value add, or the more that a VC says, I'm going to add value, the more you should hear them say, I'm going to annoy the ever living crap out of you for the rest of the time that I'm on the cap table. And I'm I think that about it. it's really bad. And so I think our approach is more you know, we are going to invest in the company because we believe that that founder or that group of founders are the people that are going to grow this business. If we believe that we, Founders Fund, are necessary to make the business work, we should be investing in ourselves, not in the founders. And so in some ways, the VCs that say they're the most value added are actually telegraphing to the founders that they think they're bad and that actually the thing that's going to make them good is taking money from them rather than someone else. And I think that's kind of a betrayal of the entrepreneurial spirit that you should be having in the tech industry. Um, you know, one other thing with Keith that I thought was so fascinating, so much ink was spilled over him going to Miami and then now, you know, coming back uh, in a part-time capacity with Coastal Ventures. 
But you and I had talked last week and you said that really the, the bulk of Founders Fund's team is in the Bay Area. I mean, you're, you're in Costa Mesa, some members are still, two people are still in Florida. But I thought that, I don't think people realize that. I think that the firm really like up, up and, and left the Bay Area. Yeah, we did not. Uh, the vast majority of the team is still in San Francisco. I will say this, so when, um, but right before Facebook started, um, Peter, uh, Peter Thiel, who's one of my partners that is the founder of Founders Fund, uh, he gave a speech at Stanford, and he said that the next trillion dollar tech company, or some variation of that, is going to be founded within 10 miles of this room. And he was right, and he was the first investor in Facebook, um, and this is, by the way, something all of you should know about Peter. When Peter says something, don't disagree with him. He's always right. <laughs> even if, you, even he, if he thinks he might be wrong, he ends up being right. It's incredibly annoying. Um, but, uh, you know, that he was, he, it was a true statement. It turns out that in that, in that, you know, vintage, tech was really centered around the Bay Area. And even when I joined Founders Fund 10 years ago, it was really a, a Bay Area game. Silicon Valley was still the dominant force. Um, I think if you look at Fund 5, which is the fund that I entered at Founders Fund, um, something like 60 to 70% of our investments were Bay Area companies. If you look at Fund uh, 7, which is the last vintage, um, the majority of the companies were ex-Bay Area. They were, they were not in the Bay Area. And so I think that the, the Miami office, you know, uh, the whatever people thought was like Founders Fund relocating to Miami, that was never the case. Um, the idea was that if things are geographically distributed, our, so we should have people on our team that are closer to the other things that are interesting. And it turns out that there's a lot of stuff going on in the Eastern Seaboard, whether that's Miami or Atlanta has a, has a burgeoning tech culture, Washington DC, there are some interesting companies that are at least operationally doing stuff there, New York City, Canada, like there's a lot of things that are a five hour flight from San Francisco, but are a two hour flight from Miami. And so we do have a couple of people on our investment team that are based there. I think they are doing a great job. They're not exclusively looking at Miami tech companies. Um, one thing that Peter said years ago, maybe this was like in 2015 when everybody was talking about autonomous cars, was that everybody was over indexing on autonomous cars and under indexing on telecommuting, which of course I think ended up to be True to some extent. Um, okay, also sort of an obnoxious question, but then Keith again today was at Upfront Summit talking and he told Alex Conrad of Forbes that he thinks, I don't even remember exactly what the full context was, but basically that people in the Bay Area are lazy compared with other markets. They're not willing to work nine to nine. They're not willing to work Saturdays. Um, I guess two things, do you agree? And also do you think and a founder should be working those hours. Does that make sense to you? I'll answer this question by telling a story. <laughs> so, I, I, as you mentioned, I used to work for the government. In the government, when you speak publicly, the goal is to say as many words as possible without saying anything. And generals are exceptionally good at doing this. They could sit on the stage for 30 minutes talking and it's just like the teacher from Charlie Brown, like wah, wah, wah. They're not saying anything. They're just saying a set of words that have been accepted to be, you know, okay by their PR teams. Keith is really good at saying things that journalists ask about later. And that's actually good. That's good for Keith. He made us talk about him here on stage. He, he wins. I, I think the reality is, is there aren't enough people in the world that say things that people remember that are worth talking about later. And so my goal for the rest of this 11 minutes and 53 seconds Not is to, to find Keith something again. that I can say that someone will ask about later today or tomorrow. <laughs> can you believe Trey said that? <laughs> I think I've got a question for that, but that comes up later. Um, <laughs> I did want to ask you though, okay, so this question is something that is probably sort of obvious, but also you talk about VCs, um, you know, not, adding a lot of value, and yet as a founder and a co-investor, you work with a lot of VCs. So um, if they are more involved with the companies, how does that, I mean, I guess, you know, for example, Anderson Horowitz is an Anduril, it's a big investor. How do you think their model is so very different from yours? I mean, maybe it's not more hands-on, but it's very sprawling, it's, they do take board seats, I guess. Is that just kind of like the cost of doing business? Do you privately think like other VCs don't really, you know, 
add, yeah, add I, value? I think different VCs might ap appeal to different founders. Um, I think some founders really like the idea of a really hands-on kind of mentor. Um, other founders don't. And you know, I think we have a great track record inside of our portfolio in particular of capturing these kind of lightning out of bottle founders that their, maybe their prior experience with VCs, their prior experience with board members is quite negative. Um, and th they decide that they want someone around the table that's going to support them and let them run the ship. Um, I know that some of my portfolio companies are actually in the room right now, so I hope that nothing that I'm saying right now is making you feel like you're not supported. I love you both. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to ask about another portfolio company, OpenAI, which congratulations, I guess, on getting uh, um, some of that company. So. Back to Keith, he's the one who told me this uh, a while ago that- He's he, winning right he's now. He's winning, Keith is winning, he's always winning. Um, but uh, you know, you bought secondary shares as did a lot of other people. They just had this, you know, another secondary sale. Um, a lot of open AI employees now have made a lot of money, which is great, but I do wonder as an investor if that worries you. And also if you've got a stance on when is too soon, if it's ever too soon, um, for a, a company to sort of dole out secondary shares to, or, or let their employees sell their shares? Yeah, uh, I think the reality is in tech, um, the competition for talent is really fierce. And companies want their employees to believe that their equity has real monetary value. And so obviously it would be bad if you said you can sell 100% of your equity, your vested equity, but I think at a fairly early stage, it's probably a good idea to say, look, you've got 100,000 shares vested. Maybe you can sell 5 or 10% of that every year in a company facilitated tender so that you feel like when you're being compensated with equity, that's real and that's part of your total comp package. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a good thing. Obviously, with founders, this is a little different. Like, you don't want founders cashing out in big chunks from their own companies. Um, I'm not worried about this with OpenAI. I think Sam is doing just fine without any OpenAI tender. Um, and I think the executive team there is, is quite the same. The, the head of research, for example, at OpenAI, who's less well known but very important in the business is Bob McGrew, who was the director of engineering at Palantir prior to my co-founder, the CEO at Android, Brian Schimpf. Um, and, you know, Bob has, he's fine as well. I don't think he's like in the position where he needs to see that equity as real comp. I guess I, I get it. And Sam, right, I don't think, I mean, th so those two are not doing it uh, for financial reasons. They don't have to. But I guess it's just the scale is so different. So, you know, even when we were seeing some uh, startups during the um, pandemic, you know, like $7 billion companies giving their employees money. But here you're talking about like an $85 billion valuation. So like a 5 to 10% stake is actually worth a lot, but, but st still, you don't... Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think if you start seeing that there's a performance degradation r related to people checking out because they have too much liquidity, well then, yeah, that becomes a pretty serious problem. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen that happen at OpenAI. I feel like they're all super mission motivated mm -hmm. to you know, get to AGI, and um, that, that's a really meaty mission. That might not, by the way, work as well at like, a boring enterprise SaaS company where people are like, I don't really care about this. I'm going to make my money and I'm going to leave. Like, I, I think being mission motivated definitely helps. Yeah. I know how you feel about boring SaaS companies. <laughs> not a huge fan. <laughs> um, so speaking of things that are not boring SaaS companies, SpaceX is one of your investments. Uh, Neuralink is one of your investments. Are you in any other Musk-related companies now? Are you in Boring? We're in Boring Company. We're in Neuralink. We're in SpaceX. Are you in X? No. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No. No. <laughs> um, I guess I just wanted to ask, you're in the business of Elon Musk, as anybody, I guess, would, would want to be who's an investor, but are you worried about him? Are you worried about a breaking point? Because as we all sort of have a little bit more transparency into his day-to-day, -day, or we feel like we do, sometimes I think there is a concern. I'm not personally concerned. I think, you know, Elon is one of the most unique and generational talents uh, that... I, I think I'll see for the rest of my life. And, you know, there's always trade-offs, right? Like, you know, at some IQ point, you go above that and the trade-offs become quite severe. And you, you start having all sorts of other issues that are going on in your life. 
Um, and Elon has a set of trade-offs. He's incredibly intense. He will outwork anyone. He's brilliant. He's able to organize a lot of stuff in his brain. Um, and there are going to be other parts of life that suffer. Um, I think that's probably the case with me too. Like, uh, not in the same way as Elon, but maybe I'm like too extroverted. I'm too nice, uh, and that causes me pain in other areas. So I'm not really concerned about Elon. I think. You know, uh, he has proven his doubters wrong over and over again. And um, I guess most, if it, there are other VCs in this room, I think a lot of people have seen their portfolios be pretty significantly impacted by him being a, a once in a generation character. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk to you about Andrel, which I think is such a fascinating company and such an increasingly important company. Um, I, uh, you know, you're, you're building autonomous vessels, autonomous aircraft. Uh, I read in a government trade magazine last year that the tech, some of your tech can allow a single operator to control hundreds of, of drones at once. Um, I guess, can you give us a preview of anything that you're working on? So I know the Roadrunner came out not that long ago, this VTOL that can carry various uh, different payloads. Um, you are very involved in the day-to-day, -day. I mean, more so than I realized before we were sort of talking about this interview. If anything that you can share would be... Yeah, so the, the kind of the nature of Andrel and what we're doing there is that um, the, the, the threat that we're facing globally is very different than it was in the, you know, 2000 through 2020, where we were primarily talking about non-state actors, terrorist organizations, insurgent groups, rogue states, things like that. Um, and it looks more like a uh, Cold War conflict against near-peer adversaries, great powers. And the way that we engaged with great power conflict during the Cold War was by building these really expensive, exquisite systems. Nuclear deterrence, aircraft carriers, multi-hundred million dollar aircraft, uh, these exquisite missile systems that are very expensive. And we find ourselves in these conflicts where our adversaries are showing up with low cost attributable systems. Things like, you know, a $100,000 Iranian Shahed kamikaze drone or a $750,000 Turkish TB2 by Raktar or, you know, um, rocket, like simple rockets and uh, DJI drones with grenades attached to them with little gripper claws. And, you know, our response to that historically has been shoot a two and a quarter million dollar Patriot missile at it because that's what we have. That's what's in our inventory. But this isn't a scalable solution for the future. So Andrew, at Andrew, we've looked at this problem since we were founded in 2017 and said, how can we reduce the cost of engagement while also removing the human operator, the men and women who are you know, serving us in the battlefield, removing them from the threat of light, loss of life, from things that are dull, dirty, and dangerous. And these capabilities are not hardware capabilities, largely. You know, it's not like building a really cool aircraft carrier or building a sixth generation manned fighter plane. This is about autonomy, and autonomy is a software problem. The problem is, as you pointed out before, um, tech people get paid a lot of money uh, in successful tech companies. And so if you had the option of like going and working in a concrete basement in Tucson uh, for $100,000 a year or getting paid a half a million dollars a year bringing your dog to work and eating free food in ball pits at Google, maybe you're going to go work at Google instead. Um, the difference is, is that during the Cold War, our most talented people in the disciplines that mattered, whether it's aerospace design, radar design, microwaves, radio communications, they all worked with the Defense Department. Today, and the capabilities that matter the most, they're in ball pits at Google. This isn't really helpful. And so Anderl approached this and said, we want to build a company that's a software-defined defense contractor um, that is hardware-enabled. And so we're bringing these systems, these autonomous systems that are low cost, that are, uh, that are removing our men and women from harm's way, and we're supplementing the existing capabilities to create a continued deterrent impact so that we avoid global conflict. So software defined hardware enabled versus hardware defined software enabled, which is much less expensive because the units are so much smaller. Is that basically it? Well, it, it's... Life support systems are expensive. Mm -hmm. Building a manned fighter plane costs a lot more money right. than building a drone. Um, same thing for aircraft carriers. You know, it, it, one missile can destroy an aircraft carrier with 5,000 human lives on it. Uh, you want to do things in attributable ways that reduce the cost of life and the capital cost of deploying these systems 
that still allow you to demonstrate total technological superiority on the battlefield to the extent that you prevent conflict from ever happening. And so uh, I mentioned to you, I'd read, read a story recently where um, someone had talked to one of the primes, as they're called, and they had kind of rolled their eyes and they said that these upstarts don't know enough yet about mass production. Is that a concern for you or is, are they just thinking about what you're doing the wrong way? No, I mean, quite frankly, they're right. Um, startups don't know how to do mass production. Um, the primes also don't know how to do mass production. Uh, you can look at the Boeing 737 problem if you want some evidence of that. Um, we have no supply of Stinger, Stingers, Javelins, HIMARS, Gimlers, Patriot missiles. They can't make them fast enough. And the reason is they built these supply chains and manufacturing facilities that are more like the manufacturing facilities of the Cold War. Um, to look at a kind of an analogy to this, um, when Tesla went out to build at massive scale, they said, we need to build an autonomous factory from the ground up to actually hit the demand uh, requirements for producing at a low cost and at the scale that we need to grow. And GM looked at that and they said, that's ridiculous. This company will never scale. And then five years later, it was evident that they were just getting absolutely smoked. And so I think the primes are saying this because it's the defensive reaction that they would have to say, these upstarts will never get it. While I think Andrew is trying to build a Tesla that says, no, we're going to build a modular autonomous factory that's going to be able to keep up with the demand that the customer is throwing at us. Um, and, you know, it's a big bet, but we hired the guy that did it at Tesla. His name is Keith Flynn. He's now our head of production. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we'll see where things go. Um, you know, I did want to ask you quickly an obvious question that I'm sure you also get a lot is the danger of autonomous systems. So Sam Altman at one of these events had told me years ago that that was really his biggest fear when it comes to AI. So uh, I wonder how you think about that. Yeah, there's, there's a tech implementation side of this and kind of a philosophical ethical side of it. On the ethical side of it, you know, th throughout the course of human history, we've gotten more and more violent, right? We started with like punching each other and then hitting each other with rocks and then eventually we figured out metals and we started making swords and bow and arrows and spears and then we built catapults and trebuchets and then eventually we got to the advent of gunpowder and then we started dropping bombs on each other and then in the 1940s, we reached the point where we realized we had this actually like humanity destroying capability in nuclear weapons. Um, but then everyone kind of stopped and we stood around and we said it would not be good to use nuclear weapons We can all kind of agree. We don't actually want to do this um, And if you look at the curve of that violent potential It started coming down during the Cold War where you have precision guided munitions If you need to take out a target Can you shoot a missile through a window and only take out the target that you're intending to take out? We got much more serious about intelligence operations so we could be more precise and more discriminating in the, the attacks that we delivered. I think the reality is the autonomous systems are the, the far reach of that. It's saying, we want to prevent the loss of human life. What can we do to eliminate that to the extent possible, to be absolutely sure that when we take lethal action, we're doing it in the most responsible way possible? How can we be absolutely sure that this thing is not going to have a malfunction? How can we be absolutely sure that we're not dropping a bomb that's gonna accidentally blow up a school because we didn't have the right intelligence. So I think more information and autonomy is the best possible solution. On the tech implement, implementation side of things, people for a long time have said like, you know, we're really scared about fully autonomous weapon systems. We've had fully autonomous weapon systems for 50 years. There are fully autonomous weapon systems on aircraft carriers that do um, counter air, that they, you know, detect something in the airspace and then fire a bunch of bullets to try to knock it out. There's no human operator on those things. So the question is about how are you employing these technologies? There are some situations where you'd want to be sure that there's a human operator that's in the loop making the decisions. There are other situations where you do want a computer actually doing the fire control to make sure that you take out the target before it hurts people. Um, am I scared of Terminator? Sure, there's some potential hypothetical future where the AGI becomes sentient and decides that we would be better off making paper clips. We're not close to that right now. No one in the DOD or any of our allies and partners is talking about sentient AGI taking over the world and that being the goal of the DOD. Um, but 
in, I think, 2016, Vladimir Putin, in a speech to the Technical University in Moscow, said, he who controls AI controls the world. And so I think we have to be very serious about recognizing that our adversaries are doing this. They're going to be building into this future, and their goal is to beat us to that. And if they beat us to it, I'd be much more concerned about that Terminator reality than if we, in a democratic Western society, were the ones that controlled the edge. Speaking of Putin, Ukraine, um, what, what is Angel doing there? Uh, we're deployed all over the world in conflict zones, including Ukraine. Um, you know, you, you go into a conflict with the technology you already have, not with the technology you hope to have in the future. And so much of the technology that the United States, the UK, Germany, that we sent over to Ukraine were Cold War era technologies. We were sending them things that were sitting in warehouses that we needed to get out of our inventory as quickly as possible. So Anderil's goal, aside from supporting those conflicts to the extent possible, is to build the capabilities that we need to build to ensure that the next time there's a conflict, we have a big inventory of stuff that we can deploy very quickly to support our, our allies. So, so are you like in Poland and Finland and or, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to disclose, okay. but we are deployed globally okay, in a number okay. of different complex zones. Okay, good, because it sounds like we're going to need help. Um, I did want, okay, a couple of, um, a, a couple of uh, sort of cornyish questions, but um, sincere. So I did want to ask you, you, you're privy to conversations that we probably can't imagine between Palantir and Andril and SpaceX. So I did want to... I was thinking about you, I was watching uh, this terrible Julia Roberts movie on Netflix about like uh, a cyber attack that ends the world. And I just wondered, what, what is like in your survival kit? Like what do you, because I'm sure you do think about that, right? And is it in a bunker? <laughs> uh, I do have a bunker. I can, can confirm um, what's in my survival kit. I, I don't think I have any interesting ideas here. It's like, you know, you want non-perishables, you want a big supply of water. It might not hurt to have some shotguns. I don't know. Uh, find your own bunker. It turns out you can buy Cold War era missile silos that make for great bunkers. And there's one for sale right now in Kansas. And I would encourage any of you that are interested to check it out. That is really wild. Um, and last question, I just wanted to ask. I mean, you're obviously very passionate about this country. You worked in government service. You work with Peter Thiel, who has thrown his resources behind a couple of people who have been elected to public office, including now uh, Senator J.D. Vance. I just wondered if we'll ever see you run for office. I'm not personally opposed to the idea, but my wife, who I love very much, said <laughs> she would divorce me if I ever ran for public <laughs> office. So the answer is a strong no. OK, great. Trey, thank you so much. Really so great to meet you and thank spend time you. with you. Thank you.